uh, family and friends. Uh, we're going to give this a couple of minutes and then we'll get started with our Wednesday night Bible study. Let me get this sent over across our platforms real quick. All right, this should be up on the private page. We're doing it also on the uh, the Maple Springs public page. For those of you who like this, uh, I felt like as I was thinking about it, there's nothing that we're talking about that's secretive. So we'll put it on both pages on Wednesday night. So if you're a guest and uh, you don't attend Maple Springs, uh, welcome. We're glad that you're here. And um, I hope that you have had a good week with all that's going on with COVID and it's definitely been a uh, interesting week here at the church. We had to get the facilities uh, clean, had a little COVID scare, but as you can see, I'm back in the facilities, so uh, everything is doing well and we're doing okay. Um, if you do have any prayer requests tonight, and they are public if you put them on Facebook, uh, feel free to drop them in a comment there, and I will try to read them as they come up, and we can pray about those. Um if you have a personal one, you're welcome to send it to me privately if you don't want everybody to know about it. But uh, if you do have a prayer request, feel free to just put it there. If I don't read it, it's not because I don't want to share your requests. It's that they come across this screen right here, a little screen that I'm looking at on my desk. They come across very fast. And um, so if I don't get to them or I do not read them, uh, I will um, make sure I pray about them later. Okay? Is that a deal? Uh, so thank you for uh, being here and meeting with us in this way. And then we'll put this up on YouTube later for those of in our church family that do not have Facebook. I would guess, I was, I was looking at it today, I'd guess 90% of our church family has Facebook. Uh, but we want to make sure that that other 10% uh, is able to access this as well. Uh, so we'll put this up later. Let me see if we have any prayer requests that have come through anything that we can pray about. I got it pulled up on my computer here. So if you have anything, just type it. Margaret, thank God for his many blessings every day. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. God is so good to us, so much better than we deserve. Amen. Uh, I don't deserve his grace or his mercy, and that's why it is grace and mercy, right? Um, Clay Hill, the few, the proud, the Wednesday night crowd. Yeah, but there's more tonight online than there. Uh, might be here. I guess we normally have about 30 or so uh, on Wednesday night Bible study. We're getting close to that number now. Um, but if there's anybody else that has a prayer request, go ahead and type it in and I'll be happy to read it. I'll give it a couple more seconds here. Got it pulled up on my computer. I did want to say some of you have been asking about our plan for Sunday. If we're going to have drive-in, if we're going to have online. First of all, I want to say thank you to our church family for submitting your surveys. Uh, we sent out a survey with, with quite a few, probably about 10 questions uh, for the future. Uh, it was very helpful for us to be able to determine what we think we need to do uh, in the very near future, obviously, and I hope that you're gracious with this, but obviously it's new to all of us, and um, none of us have ever experienced this before. I tell people... I never had a class in this in seminary of what to do during a pandemic. So obviously at one point we tried to come inside and we realized that was probably a little premature. It was probably a little soon, especially given the cases rose and we had some cases in our church and, and then some in our facilities here. Um, and so we, we have not made a definite decision. A lot of people have talked about maybe just doing it online because it's so hot. Um, but I do, I really do like the drive-in service so much better than just preaching to a camera. Uh, but we will let you know the deacons and I are meeting, uh, tonight after Bible study, I believe. And, uh, so we will let you know probably tomorrow or Friday 
what we're going to do there and what the preliminary plan is for the future. Obviously, those things can change, but thank you for being gracious. I, I think this pandemic has uh, made me lose more hairs on my head and some turn gray, but but that's okay. God knew it was coming. God's in control. This is his church. He's going to get us through it. And I won't say that I haven't stressed about it because I want to be honest. And my wife is probably watching and knows how much I have stressed about all of this, but it's going to be okay. Uh, God's going to take care of it. And uh, let's see if we have any prayer requests, just some greetings. Thank the Lord for another day. Amen. Well, we're glad that you're here. We're going to pray. And uh, then we're going to do uh, our Bible study for tonight. And I'll tell you what that is going to be after we pray. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful, Lord, for this evening. We thank you for this opportunity as church family and friends to be able to gather together, even in this online manner on Facebook. We thank you for the, the opportunities that Facebook gives us to be able to communicate and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, so, Father, I pray that you would be with us. I pray that you'd be with our witness, Lord, during this pandemic. I pray that we would exemplify the Lord Jesus Christ and, Lord, that we would display to a lost and dying world who Jesus is and what he's done in our life. Father, thank you for showing such grace and mercy to us. As so many people commented, uh, thank you for how good you are to us. God, we we do not deserve it. We don't deserve your grace and your mercy but Lord, you lavish it upon us. And so God, we're so grateful. God, for any prayer requests on our hearts and minds tonight, for anyone who is battling sickness and, or dealing with a death, I just pray for your comfort to be with them. I pray that you would work things out according to what your predetermined plan is. And Father, as we look at your word tonight for our Bible study, I, I just pray that you would help us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I did want to tell you one thing before we got into our Bible study tonight from the surveys. One thing that came up constantly was how much people like the online and hopefully, uh, and they were hoping that we'd be able to keep the online. Our hope and, and our um, intent is to continue to offer everything that we do on campus online as well. Now, we don't want that uh, to be an opportunity for you to get lazy but we want it to be a help to you. For instance, you might work a job and not be able to get here on Wednesday nights when we open back up. You might not be able to get here by 645, but you could watch it online. We want to give you that opportunity. Now, once again, we don't want all of our church staying at home every week and not feeling the sanctuary because we believe there is something about uh, being together as a group of believers. That's what community is, and that's what church is. And boy, have we not learned during this pandemic how much we need social interaction. So I, I did want to tell you that, uh, just so that you can put that in the back of your minds. We are planning to continue uh, to stream everything Wednesday night, Sunday mornings online. So if you're on vacation or you're sick or or whatever, you're able to catch up with the service and, and know what's going on. If we're doing a study like we uh, normally do, you're able to catch into that. Tonight, I wanted to do something a little different than what we had planned. We started a book by Tom Rainer in, in, um, entitled Becoming a Welcoming Church, and obviously, I think that that was helpful for us, but it was much more suited for a small group in person than it is doing this on a live Facebook channel where I really want to be able to teach and preach the gospel. And so I've decided for the time being, we're going to do something different. We'll probably come back and finish Becoming a Welcoming Church. And if you got a copy of it, a couple people did get a copy, please read the rest of it. It is so important. If you got any questions, let me know. Uh, it's a very important study, but I think it's so important for us uh, to get into the Word of God right now. And so I picked a book of the Bible that I think will be meaningful to us during these times, and that's 1 Thessalonians. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're going to look at the first chapter tonight of 1 Thessalonians and see um, what the Word of God teaches us. And, and there's so much in 1 Thessalonians, and there's quite a bit about, at the end of 1 Thessalonians, about the day of the Lord and about uh, Christ's coming and about our conduct before unbelievers and uh, so all these things, anxiety, I'm looking at all the things it's it's talking about here, encouragement, prayer, sanctification, working for the Lord, 
all things that we need to be busy about. So as I like to do, I, I do not try to be a difficult preacher. I just want to go through it, uh, through the first chapter and just explain kind of what it's talking about and give us some challenges. So if we start in the first verse, that's always the best place to start is the very first verse of the book. We see the introduction and, and here's what it says in verse one. I probably should have given you a second to get there. Um, okay. You found it by now, right? It says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. So in this first verse, the introduction is given of who the author is and who he is writing to. Uh, we're familiar with the first name, especially if you've been in church in any length of time. Paul, predominant portion of the New Testament, was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, the second two names, the middle one especially, might not be as familiar to you. His name is Silvanus. You might also know him as Silas in the book of Acts. He was a Jewish convert who came to faith in Christ, but was also a Roman like Paul. And then we have Timothy, and you're familiar with Timothy. Timothy was Paul's companion in the ministry. He was much younger than Paul, and Paul became a teacher to him in the ways of being a pastor. And if you want to read more of Paul's letters to Timothy, you can read First and Second Timothy, right? That he writes to this young pastor who's pastoring this church. And next, Paul is going uh, to move on to thanksgiving. That's what the second half of this passage, and that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time, about Paul um, dealing with thanksgiving. And this is really common for Paul to always start a letter and give the introduction and share who it is who's writing and then break out into thanksgiving. And I think as we think about this and we look at the layout of this book, I think that's a model for us, right? What if every day we started with thanksgiving? What if every prayer that we offered to God, we started with thanksgiving? What if every conversation we had on the phone we started with Thanksgiving, and that's how Paul, if you look at the most of Paul's letters, he's going to give an introduction of who he is, and then he's going to break out into Thanksgiving to God. I believe it would change the way we think about things. I believe it would change everything. I mean, imagine if during this pandemic, you started your day every morning and listed and thought about the things that you're thankful for, God's grace and God's mercy. You have enough food uh, on your plate. You have a roof over your head. You have clothes to wear. I mean, we could continue on and on and on to talk about all the things that we're thankful for. And that's how Paul always starts his letter. So what is Paul thankful for? Look at the rest of chapter one, and that's where we're going to focus. Look at what he says. He says, we always thank God for all of you, making mention of you constantly in our prayers. We recall in the presence of our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. You know how we lived among you for your benefit. And you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord when in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. Therefore, we don't need to say anything. For they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So Paul lists in these uh, nine verses the things that he is thankful for in the Thessalonians. 
And I hope that this can be a challenge to us of things that are also in our life. And so I want to list for you the five things Paul says he's thankful for. And then what I want to do is very quickly go through each of those five things to discuss uh, what Paul means when he says this. Paul, so if you have a piece of paper, if you have a pen nearby, grab it. I encourage you to write these down um, and it'll kind of serve as our outline for tonight, so to, so to speak. Paul lists five things he's thankful for. First of all, Paul says, I'm thankful for your work, your labor, and your endurance for Jesus. Your work, your labor, and your endurance for Jesus. Then secondly, Paul says, I'm thankful for the fact that God has chosen you. The fact that God has chosen you, I'm thankful for that. Thirdly, Paul says, I'm thankful that you became imitators of me, Silas, and Timothy. And, and if you're not, if I'm going too fast, I'm going to come back to each one of these and talk about them specifically. So if you're writing them down, I know my students in high school say, you're going too fast. I know I talk fast, but we're going to come back to them. Fourthly, Paul says, I'm thankful for the fact that your faith has gone out to the entire world. And then fifthly and finally, Paul says, I'm thankful for your testimony. So I want to talk about these five areas, these five things in this passage that Paul says he's thankful for. So first of all, uh, the first thing that I gave you tonight, Paul says he's thankful for the Thessalonians and their work, their labor, and their endurance for Jesus. Look back at verse 3. He says, we recall in the presence of our Lord and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says he is thankful because this church, the church of Thessalonica, has not been lazy. They have been working for Jesus. They have been laboring for Jesus. They have been enduring for Jesus. And because of that, Paul's saying their faith is not formal. Their faith is not barren. Their faith is not dead. And faith, when we have true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it produces works in our life. A passage that talks about this is James chapter 2, verse 26. I want you to listen to this. James 2, 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is also dead. Meaning we're saved by faith. But once we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and we have true faith, it should promote in us, it should produce in us some type of work that we want to do for the Lord Jesus Christ. How many Christians, and maybe this is you, I don't know, how many Christians get complacent and don't do anything? There is always something to do, even during a pandemic. There is always something to do in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, work doesn't save us. We're not saved by works. The Bible makes that clear time and time again. There's no work that you can do that's going to be enough to get you into heaven. I mean, you could win a million souls to Jesus, and that's not enough if you've not made that personal decision and, and walk of faith to trust in Christ. You see, it's our faith that saves us, but work has to accompany our faith. And so this church had it right, and Paul says, I'm thankful that you work. I'm thankful that you labor. I'm thankful that you endure. And look at what Paul says their work and labor were motivated by in verse 3. He says, your labor motivated by love. They had love for Jesus. They had love for other people. Why do we work in the church? Why do, why do you do stuff in the church? Those of you who are listening are members of Maple Springs. Why do you do things here? Uh, why do you work in the nursery? Good Lord, I did not need to work in the nursery. That's not for me. But why do you work in the nursery? Why do you sing in the choir? Why do you help with properties? Why do some of you come up here and pick up uh, sticks out of the yard? Why do you cut the shrubs? Why do you clean the toilets? Why do you vacuum the floors? Hopefully you're not doing that so that you can impress the pastor. Hopefully you're doing that for, for one basic reason, love. You love the Lord Jesus Christ and you love his church 
And so you're going to work and you're going to labor and you're going to endure because of the love that you have for Jesus. And that's what this church has. The church at Thessalonica, they have love for Jesus. This church was busy, busy, busy for Jesus. Beloved, let me tell you something that's really on my heart. I believe that some great things can come out of this pandemic. I really believe it. Because during this pandemic, we are not so focused on inward things of our church, but we can be focused on outward, reaching out and working for the gospel. And I hope that this has been a call to all churches. If you're listening to this from another church, I hope that this has been a call to your church to reach out, to not be inward. Listen, let me tell you, if our church becomes inward, it will die. We have to be an outward focused church. And this church, the church at Thessalonica, and Paul says, I'm thankful for it. They're an outward focused church. So their work, their labor, their endurance for Jesus. But then Paul says something secondly, I'm thankful for. In verses four and five, Paul says, I'm thankful that God has chosen you. Look at verses four and five. He says, for we know brothers and sisters loved by God. That, here's the phrase that he has chosen you. Because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power in the Holy Spirit and with full assurance, you know how we lived among you for your benefit. Paul makes it clear it wasn't persuasive words that changed the Thessalonians' hearts towards God. It wasn't that he came in and, and gave a wonderful sermon because honestly, if we look at a lot of Paul's uh, teachings and things, I don't believe Paul was a very exciting speaker. Paul says it wasn't in the power of my words. It was in the fact that God has chosen them to be saved. And God says, hey, I'm thankful today that God has chosen me for salvation and I'm thankful that God has chosen you. And beloved, I'm thankful for that today. I don't know about you. Maybe you put a little heart on the screen if you're thankful for that, that God has chosen you. Now, listen, that can cause a lot of heartburn in the church because you're saying, Pastor, you're, you're going into Calvinism. No, I'm, I'm just teaching you what the Bible says. The Bible does say he has chosen us. Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. If you want to flip there, I'll give you a second. Uh, I don't know how you can look at this passage in the book of Romans chapter 9 and not believe that the Bible says in some manner that he has chosen us. Look at what it says in Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us, meaning he chose us. He, he predestinated us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he has lavished on us and the beloved one. Beloved, the, the, the idea and the fact and the theology of being chosen is a biblical principle. And it literally means that we take salvation out of our hands and we completely put it in the hands of God. And listen, it's hard to understand. Because I'm going to tell you, and I tell you this a lot, and so if you're just tuning in, it's the first time you've ever heard me talk about this, I want you to listen to me. The Bible says that we're chosen. You can see that in Ephesians 1, 4 through 7. You can see this in this passage right here. Paul says, I'm thankful that you're chosen, that he chose us. But the Bible also says that we have to make a decision. So we have divine sovereignty versus human free will, but there's no verses because both of them are taught in the Bible. You say, Pastor, how do you reconcile the fact that God chooses, but people have a decision? Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher, once said, I never try to reconcile two friends. And so somehow in the mind of God, he can choose, according to this passage in Ephesians 1, he can choose before the foundation of the world in such a way that it does not impact our free decision to trust in Christ. You say, Pastor, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's exactly the point. There has to be things about God because he's God that we don't understand. Remember, the Bible says his ways are higher than our ways as the heavens are higher than the earth. So are his ways higher than our ways. He's chosen us. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. It makes me feel real special that I know Jesus Christ and that 
out of all the people in this world, he, before the foundation of the world, the Bible teaches that he chose me as his adopted son. What an amazing thing. But then Paul says, thirdly, there's something else he's thankful about in verse six. He says, I'm thankful that you became imitators of me and Silas and Timothy. Look at verse six. He says, and you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord when in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. Paul understood the value of living a holy life before other believers. And he realized and he encouraged believers to follow his example. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he makes it very clear where he says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Be an imitator of me because I'm an imitator of Jesus. And the second part of that verse is so important. Paul encourages them, hey, be an imitator of me, not because there's anything special about me, but be an imitator of me because I am an imitator of God. You see, beloved, that second part is where the importance is in. If Paul said, be an imitator of me because I'm pretty cool, we'd have a problem. But Paul says, be an imitator of me because I'm imitating Christ. So literally, when you're imitating me, you're actually imitating Jesus. And I think there's a good principle here. I want you to listen to this closely. Imitate people in your life who are truly following and serving Christ, but always remember that they are not Christ. (laughs) I want you to listen to that one more time. Imitate people in your life who are truly following and serving Christ. There might be people in your life and and they are godly people. Imitate them. Imitate the principles that they follow from Christ. But always remember that they're not Christ. Be very careful to not put people on a pedestal that only Christ should be on. Um, If people get on a pedestal, let me tell you what's going to happen. They're going to fall. We're not made to be on a pedestal. Don't if if I'm that person for you and you say I'm gonna imitate you as my my pastor, that's fine. The things that I do in Christian love, you imitate. But listen to me. Don't put me on a pedestal. Only put Jesus on a pedestal. If you put me on a pedestal, I'm gonna fall. Um I've witnessed this in my own life and seen it in my own life, and I came across a quote that I've shared with you many times. But it says this, the best of men are men at best. We've got to follow Jesus. And so the question is, who is someone in your life that you can imitate? Um, Because if they're really following Christ, at the end of the day, you're actually imitating Christ. So uh, Paul says, I'm thankful that you became imitators of of, of me and Silas and Timothy. And then in verse 7, Paul says, I'm also thankful that your faith, has gone out to the entire world. It's not just stayed in your community. It's gone out everywhere. In verse 7, he says, As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. He says, your faith has gone out. Literally, the next verse in verse... um, Let me see if I can find it. Uh, In verse 8, it says, For the word of the Lord rang rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. That word... Uh, in in this translation says rang out the literal uh, translation is trumpeted literally uh, they became so excited about their faith they trumpeted their faith to the entire world and Paul says I'm thankful for that that people around the world are hearing about Jesus Christ because of a little church in Thessalonica and beloved what I want to happen is people around the world to hear about Jesus because of a little church in Lewisburg North Carolina known as Maple Springs Baptist Church. That's why I have such a heart for missions and missionaries because I want Maple Springs, the faith of Maple Springs, not Maple Springs, but the faith of Maple Springs to be proclaimed throughout the entire world. And and what an incredible church. They didn't stay inside. Obviously, they got outside if their faith is being trumpeted to the world and their faith is spreading everywhere. And that's the type of church we should want. I don't know about you, but that's the type of church I want. I want a church that our faith didn't just stay in right here in these buildings. And we're looking around and we're like, don't 
Don't leave these buildings. Don't, don't ever leave this. No, we want our faith to be trumpeted. See, I can get to preach it even in my office with a camera. We want our faith to be trumpeted the far sides of the world. And Paul says, Thessalonians, I'm thankful for that. And then fifthly and finally, Paul says, I'm thankful for your testimony. That's what he ends with. He says in verse nine, for uh, they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. This church had an incredible testimony. The people in this church had an incredible testimony. They had, according to Paul, turned from idols to serve the living God. Notice that that's what Paul calls God there, the living God. Why? Because when you talk about the living God, it's really a contrast to dead idols. It reminds me of Psalm 135, verses 15 through 17. You can reference that and go back and look at it later, uh, where the psalmist says, The idols of the nations are of silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak, eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Indeed, there is no breath in their mouths. So he makes his contrast between their former way of life when they followed and worshiped the dead idols to their way of life now that they are serving the living God. Amen. What a testimony. And you say, well, pastor, my testimony is not as impressive. Right? I, I don't have a testimony that I turned from idols to serve God. Well, you actually probably did if you look at it in the way that idols, idols is, is literally anything we place above God in our life. And uh, there's probably some idols in your life right now, if I'm being honest with you. It might be a sports team. It might be one of your children that's an idol for you. You're placing it above your relationship with God. It might be a new car that you have or a new house that you have. I don't know what it is, but if God's speaking to you, that's him speaking to you, not, not me. You say, I don't have a cool testimony like that. But listen, our testimony is just as special and just as reaching to other people as their testimony was. And so we should share it. And so Paul makes it clear they were sharing their testimony with the whole wide world. You realize, beloved, um, you might not have all the answers to theological questions. And listen, the honest truth is no, none of us do. I've been asked questions by high school juniors and seniors before. Um, you know, I've been through school, been through bachelor's, been through master's. Uh, I've been in full-time ministry for, for 15, 16, 17 years now, I believe it is. And I've been asked questions that I'm like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Makes you feel real stupid. So listen, if you're there and you say, I, I get nervous because I don't know the answers. I don't know all the answers. Sometimes I have to look them up. Sometimes I have to do the hard work. There's been times I've, I've, I've told students, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll try to have you an answer tomorrow. And I'd go home and look it up and try to come back with an answer uh, that would appease them. But you know what? Nobody can question when you share the gospel with people and you don't have to answer. Quite. Tell them your testimony. Tell them how your life has changed. You might not have been following idols, but you were living a life unto yourself. You were not living a life unto God, and God uh, chose you before the foundation of the world. You weren't looking for God, but God was looking for you. And he came to you and he saved you. And you share that with a lost and dying world. So Paul, in this first chapter, tells us the things that he's thankful for. He says, I'm thankful for your work, your labor, your endurance. Let me go back to that. Um, are you working for the Lord? Are you enduring? Are you laboring for Jesus? That God has chosen them. That's what he's thankful for. Are you thankful for that, that God chose you before the foundation of the world? That makes you feel real special. If you wake up and you say, I don't feel special, you might wake up tomorrow and say, I, you might deal with depression and anxiety. And listen, if you do, uh, that's okay. We all deal with those issues sometimes. And if it gets severe, you need to get some help. But if you wake up tomorrow and you say, I'm not special, you just remember that God chose you before the foundation of the world. That should make you feel real special. And then... Paul says, be imitators. Uh, I'm thankful that you became imitators of me, Silas and Timothy. Who's somebody you can imitate? Paul says, I'm thankful that your faith has gone out to the entire world. Let me ask you a question. Has your faith ever gone out? I'm not talking to the entire world. I'm just saying, has your faith ever left your mouth? 
You say, how do I do that? The last one, Paul says, I'm thankful for your testimony. And Paul begins that letter with this list of things that he's thankful for. I really wonder how our mindset would change if we would start with thankfulness. If, if we would start church meetings with thankfulness, if, if we would start our mornings instead of, oh, I got to wake up, oh gosh, I got to go to work, I don't feel good. If we would start our day with, God, thank you for allowing me to wake up. Thank you for giving me a job. The Bible says, in everything, give thanks. The good times and the bad. Ha have you ever come before God and said, God, I don't like this pandemic, but I want to thank you for the things that it's taught me. I want to thank you for the things that are important to me. Let me tell you, more important to me, the things that I've learned and that I'm thankful for, number one, I'm thankful for my church family. I miss you guys and being able to hug you and be able to be with you. And I've realized how important that is. And I think I've gotten to a point that honestly, I was just used to it. Every Sunday, it was a routine. You got to, let me tell you, that first Sunday that we're back together and the virus is gone, whenever that might be, I'm going to be running laps around the building. Now, i got to lose some weight before that happens, but I won't be running some, way, some laps around this building. I'm thankful for my family and the time that we've been able to spend together uh, during this pandemic. I, I, I'm thankful for my health and realizing there's so many people. And yes, I'm thankful for Mexican food because for so long we couldn't get it. We couldn't go sit down. And I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful for all the conveniences that we have in the United States. But maybe you would start your day that way. Paul starts his letter that way, and I think it would change a lot of things if we started with that mindset. Uh, let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would help us to have that mindset. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us to, um, Father, be thankful. And Father, I just want to tell you that I'm thankful I'm thankful that you love me when I'm unlovable. I thank you that you're graceful to me and merciful to me when I don't deserve it. I thank you that you chose me when I didn't deserve to be chosen. I thank you that you're in control of everything, even when I realize that I'm not in control of many things. And so, God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for this job you've given me to be the pastor of this congregation. I thank you for Maple Springs Baptist Church. Lord, how I love these people and how I desire for them to love you more and how I desire to love you more. Father, as we, I normally say go our separate ways, but as we shut off our screens, I pray that we would spend some time tonight in thanksgiving for the awesome and great things that you've done for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been so good to see you tonight. And uh, I hope that this has, has reached your heart a little bit tonight. And uh, Lawrence Tickle, I'm looking forward to that hug. You're going to get it, brother. Just you wait. You're going to get a hug. Everybody's going to get a hug. And if you didn't get to watch all of this because it's live, please go back and, and watch it. And like I said, the deacons are meaning we're making some, some plans for the future. I'll probably do a live video and explain it, and then we'll put out some, some paperwork about it so that you know. Just pray for us. Uh, and and we, we want to, my desire is I want to make 100% of the people happy. And I realize I can't do that. And so it's really bothering me. And I, I just want to do what's best. And I hope that you know my heart. I, I want to keep everybody safe, but. I also want to get back together. Listen, there's nobody who wants to get back into church more than I do. I can promise you that because speaking to a camera is not very inspiring, but it's okay. It's where we're at right now, and I'm thankful for it, but that announcement should be coming soon, okay? God bless you all. I love you. I hope you have a great night, and we will see you in one way or another on Sunday. Take care.